Seamen by Gail Langer Kurowski, pages 15 through 20. Lewis beamed. This is Seaman, the Newfoundland I purchased in Pittsburgh. Lewis turned to Clark as he spoke. I've been well pleased with him. Although he's a young animal, he retrieves game expertly. He's a wonderful swimmer. He's also quite the hunter. Why, he caught a pile of squirrels for our dinner a few weeks ago. Caught them in the water, snapped their necks, and swam right back to the boat with them. We had quite a feast, thanks to Seaman. Clark squatted, cupping Seaman's face in his large hand. There's no finer breed for water travel than a Newfoundland. That's a fact, he said, looking closely at the big black dog. Clark ran his hand over Seaman's square head and broad back. He felt the dog's muscular legs and thick fur. He smiled steady. His smile showed his approval. He's a sound, healthy creature, Merriweather. Steady and good-natured. I think he's just the dog for our journey. Seaman wagged his tail and Clark smoothed the fluffy fur around the dog's ears. He's a big fellow, though. I'll wager he weighs as much as a man. It's a good thing he knows how to hunt for some of his own groceries. Lewis and Clark spent the next two weeks in Clarksville hiring more men. Word had spread about the expedition, and many young men were eager to sign on for the adventure. The captains chose hardy fellows who seemed willing to work rather than sons of wealthy families. They chose young men who were used to living outdoors, who seemed cheerful and easy to get along with. Finally, a group was chosen and the boats were loaded. On October 26, the men pushed off. They had a downstream with the Ohio River's current. The weather was fine. On November 11th, they reached Fort Massac, where they hired a woodsman who knew some Indian language. They proceeded on. Three days later, the group made camp at the mouth of the Ohio River, at the place where it flows into the Mississippi and stayed there a week. Lewis wasn't feeling well. He had chills and fever, and seamen stayed close to him as he rested in the camp. But when the hunting parties went out to bring back game, John Coulter asked permission to take Seaman. Lewis agreed. Yes, by all means, he told Coulter. Seaman can use the exercise, and he's awfully good at retrieving game. Lewis stroked the dog's fur. Go ahead, Seaman. Seaman stood up, but hesitated, looking at Lewis. Go, Seaman, Lewis said, and pointed at Coulter. Go with Coulter. Seaman wagged his tail and ran off beside Coulter. As soon as he was feeling better, Lewis began teaching Clark to pinpoint their location of, by measuring latitude and longitude. The angle of the sun's shadow had to be recorded at midday, and at night the position of the moon and stars was measured. The readings could only be taken in clear weather. Although making, this, although making these measurements was difficult and time-consuming, it was important because the expedition would be going into lands that had never been mapped. As the explorers traveled westward, the captains would take measurements every day or two. When the expedition returned, map makers would be able to draw maps of the Northwest using the information and the captains' written reports. The captains took the night measurements after their men had gone to sleep. They used a special instrument recording every few minutes for an hour or so. Lewis taught Clark how to identify the stars and read the instrument. Together, the pair practiced, one calling out numbers for the other to record. During their evening practice, seamen lay beside Lewis and watched the captain's faces. These men were delighted by each other's company. They were so eager to begin their adventure that excitement could be read in the tone of their voices the set of their jaws, and the spring of their steps. Their mood was contagious. Everybody in the camp felt it, even calm-natured seamen. On the afternoon of November 16th, Lewis left one of the men in charge of the camp and whistled to seamen. The dog hopped into the pierogi. Clark pushed off, and the two captains rode to the western side of the Mississippi River to record the, width, the river's width. They pulled the boat onto the bank and hiked through the woods. When they approached a nearby Indian camp, some of the natives strolled over to chat. Seamen sat patiently at Lewis's side as they talked. 
One of the Indians held out his hand for Seaman to smell. The dog did not growl, and the Indian patted Seaman. He nodded at Lewis and said, Big dog. Lewis smiled. He was proud of Seaman, so he wanted to show off. Watch, he said, and he touched, tossed a stick for Seaman to retrieve. The dog fetched the stick and sat at Lewis' feet. Lewis took the stick and showed it to the Indian. No teeth marks, he said, displaying the smooth bark. The Indian nodded again. He pointed to a pile of pets. Pelts. Three, he said. Three skins. Good dog. We trade. All beaver skins. Very warm. All three for one dog. The smile faded from Lewis's face, and he turned quite pale. No trade, he said. I bought this dog for our expedition. He's worth a lot more than three beaver skins. The Indian looked at the pile of pelts as if considering how many he should offer. No trade, Lewis repeated. He turned to Clark. Let's go. As the men strode away from the Indian camp, Lewis spoke in an edgy voice. Three beaver skins? Did the fellow really think I would take three beaver skins for my dog? Why, I paid twenty dollars for seamen in Pittsburgh. A man doesn't choose just any dog to take along on a voyage to the Pacific Ocean. Look at seamen. He's a magnificent animal. As big as a calf and as docile as a kitten. Strong, too, with powerful legs. He swims like an otter. Merriweather, please, laughed Clark. The man thought he was making you a generous, generous offer. In his village, three beaver skins is probably a princely payment for any dog. Seaman is not just any dog, Lewis continued, his words tumbling out. Did you see the way he handled himself in that village? Not so much as one growl. He never left my side, sat right down as patient as a grandmother, didn't bother the food cooking over the fires, while he even ignored the village dogs. Clark threw his law, his big arm around his partner's shoulder. Merriweather Lewis, I declare, you would trade me before you'd part with that dog. Lewis laughed, his face turning pink. Well, I prized the animal for his qualifications for our journey. Of course you do, man, Clark said, chuckling. And well, you should. But the Indian's offer was not an insult. In his way, he was complimenting your choice of a dog. On November 20th, the men loaded the boats to continue their journey. They pushed into the Mississippi River and turned the boats upstream, heading toward the mouth of the Missouri River. After making camp for the winter, they would be traveling upstream on the Missouri for most of the trip west. As soon as the boats turned upstream, the captain knew they had underestimated their tasks. The boats were heavily loaded with supplies and the river's current was swift. Although the men were strong and hardy, they were straining against their oars, going against the current. It was so difficult, they had to take a zigzag course. They rowed the boats across the river, heading slightly upstream at, upstream at each crossing. But this method was terribly slow. The boats traveled about one mile upstream in each hour. It was not long before Lewis turned to Clark and spoke in a grim voice. We're going to need more muscle on our expedition. We need more men. Clark nodded. He, came to, he had come to the same conclusion. I know, but more men means we'll need more supplies. Yes, and more supplies means we'll need more boats. And more hunters to supply us with more game, Lewis frowned. Clark watched Lewis's face. It's a good thing we discovered this now, Merriweather, he said calmly. Lewis nodded. He shook off his dark mood. After all, he thought with a rush, they were about to begin the greatest adventure in the history of the United States. That's agreed then, Lewis said, clapping his hand on Clark's shoulder. We'll take on more men at the army post at Kasasakia. The expedition reached Kasasakia on November 28th. More men were recruited. More supplies were loaded. A spot was chosen for winter camp at the mouth of the Missouri River. By mid-December, the men were building Camp Wood. At first, the winter camp bustled with activity. 
The men were busy sawing, hammering, and moving supplies. As soon as Camp Wood was complete, the men settled into a routine. Lewis made trips to St. Louis to purchase more supplies, mail letters, and make arrangements. He and Clark talked with traders and trappers who had been up the Missouri River. The captain sketched information ma informational maps of their intended route based on these conversations. Seamen went on hunting trips with John Coulter. He ran beside the men on their training drills. Whenever York had time, he threw sticks into the river for seamen to retrieve. One of the younger men, George Shannon, wrestled playfully with him. By the middle of March, the Missouri, was fr the Missouri River was free of ice. The days grew warmer and the men grew restless to begin their adventure. On the morning of March 31st, Lewis and Clark sat together looking over a list of names. Seaman dozed beside Lewis as the captains talked. When they got up and strode into the open area in the center of Camp Wood, Seaman trotted along next to them. The captains ordered the men to assemble. Seaman watched as the captains announced the names of the men chosen to come on the expedition to the Pacific Ocean. Each man stepped forward as the captain called, captains called his name. These men would be the main party of explorers, the Corps of Discovery. Twenty-six men were chosen to be in the Corps of Discovery. Three sergeants were announced, Charles Floyd, Nathaniel Pryor, and John Ordway. Nine of the men were from Kentucky, including John Coulter and young George Shannon. Two of the chosen men were brothers, two were cousins, and some were friends. A few of the men had been raised by Indian mothers and could speak a few words of tribal languages. Some of the men had traded with the Indians and knew the sign language used by the tribes that lived along the Missouri River. The group included men who were expert hunters, fishermen, and trappers. There were men who could run a blacksmith forge, build, wood, build with wood, steer a boat, and play a fiddle. Almost all the men were in their late 20s or early 30s and unmarried like the captains. The captains told the rest of the men, a smaller group of about 20, that they would go along for the first part of the journey. The smaller group would return with the scientific notes and samples of plants and animals that were collected during the first leg of the journey. As soon as the announcements were finished, the men chosen to be in the Corps of Discovery whooped with joy. They shook each other's hands and slapped backs all around. George Shannon raced over to Seaman and threw his arms around the big dog's neck. At 18, Shannon was the youngest man to be chosen. Seaman licked Shannon's cheeks his tail waving back and forth. Although York's name was not read aloud, Clark put his hand on the black man's shoulder and said he would be a part of the Corps of Discovery. York broke into a little jig, and John Coulter grinned and clapped his hands. Barking happily, seamen romped around the group. Lewis and Clark watched the merriment, beaming like proud fathers. Soon the Lewis and Clark expedition would begin.